Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. Thank you for joining us. We're doing a relatively brief tour through the Bible this time in about 50 sessions. And now we're in the New Testament in Corinthians. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me and we'll read part of 1 Corinthians 13. As we go through each of these books, we try to ask the questions, what does this story or this book tell us about God? And what does this book tell us about God that isn't told somewhere else? So 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. <clears throat> Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. Ken? This is one of the most famous passages in 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. but there's lots else yes. in, in, the book of, in the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Help us with some of it. Okay. Corinthians was, a, was, a, was the, big, the major city in Greece in Paul's day. It was a port city. It was renowned for its wickedness, for its immorality, and when Paul arrived there, he's, after only a short time, he said, I'm not sure that there's anything good that I can do in a city like this. And, Paul, and God said to him, no, stay around. There's a lot of peop people I want you to reach in this city. And Paul spent a year and a half there, and more than he had spent in any of these, any other cities. And maybe the fact that so much was going on there, it's estimated that the city may have been as many as 600,000 people living in that city. And maybe it was easier for Paul to sort of get lost in the crowd, in a sense, and able to, to uh, you know, really speak his message. He worked with uh, some other tent makers, supporting himself, etc. But let's, let's talk a little bit about how these books came about. Paul is now on his third missionary journey. He has spent that year and a half in Corinth. He's gone back home. He's now on his third missionary journey, and he had promised the Ephesians he would come up, back and spend some time with them. He spent about three years with the Ephesians. While he's there, he starts getting messages about problems that were arising in the church where he'd, he'd poured out his lifeblood almost to get going there in Corinth, and he became very disturbed. Do we, do we have any how, idea how large this church was or this group of... There's a big discussion about that. Some people have said there may have been no more than 50 members. It's very likely. A short time later, there are evidence that Christians were severely persecuted in Rome. There are estimates that up to 5,000 Christians died. So if that was true in Rome, it certainly must have been true in Corinth. So others say there must have been thousands. And the reason it sometimes sounds like, as you read there, it almost sounds like he's talking to a relatively small group. People have suggested that Christians could not own large facilities, buildings. It was, they weren't a recognized group. So probably in Corinth there were a lot of small house churches. Okay, a few people went here, a few people went there, a few people there. And probably not very often did they all, or a major part of them, come together. So we need to sort of think in those terms. Well, um, I won't go into all the evidence because we, it would take a major part of our time, but there's evidence that Paul wrote another book, 
a short, uh, I should say, another letter before he wrote 1 Corinthians. Uh, maybe I should just touch on that very quickly. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9. And the letter that I wrote to you, I told you not to associate with immoral people. So Paul had already written to the Corinthians. By the time he writes 1 Corinthians, this is now his second letter. He has given them a lot of instruction. He's spoken to them very kindly. We'll talk about that in more detail. He's hoping that this will solve the problem. The word comes back. It hasn't helped. Paul decides to make a quick trip to Corinth. He probably traveled across the Aegean Sea by boat, which would take a relatively short period of time. He arrived in Corinth, and they despised him to his faith. They said, you know, your, your words are powerful and strong, but your speech is contemptible. You know, go back home. And Paul went home wondering what in the world he should do next. What he did was he sat down, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote a very potent letter. We sometimes call it the Sinai letter a little bit like God coming down on the mountain speaking to the children of Israel. And it's very likely that that letter is what we have in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. We'll look at that, some pretty strong language there. Then he sent that letter, of course there were no regular mail service of any kind in those days, certainly no email or radio or television. Paul had to send that letter by hand with Titus. And a long period of time went by and Paul got more and more worried, what in the world has happened? Are, are, how are they responding? What's going to what's going to become of the church I spent so many so much time with? And it's finally, he said, I can't wait anymore. He took off, probably near close to winter time, so he couldn't take a boat. He walked 600 miles basically around to get from Ephesus over to Corinth. But partway through that journey, he met Titus, and Titus said, They got your last letter. They took it seriously. They want you to come to Corinth and straighten things out. And Paul said, oh, thank the Lord. And so he sat down and he wrote his fourth letter to the Corinthians. And that's what we have in 2 Corinthians 1 to 9. Uh, so, so what you're saying here is we have in our, in our, in our Bible, you read 1 and 2 Corinthians. But in reality, there may be really four letters. Could be, could be really four letters mm -hmm. uh, mixed in there. Yeah. And I don't know if we should take time to, to look at all the details of that, but there, th there's pretty good evidence for that. Uh, so if you he, look at a good commentary, it'll spell that out for you. So, so he went, at the beginning, he went to the church to speak to them, and they told him, get lost. Well, not at the very beginning. He had written that first letter. Apparently, that didn't have too much of an impact. So message came back. So then he wrote what we have called First Corinthians. He wrote that whole book. He thought, okay, he answered their questions, he was polite, he wrote wonderful things to them, and apparently it, this beautiful 1 Corinthians, just, they just kind of blew it off. And all and, of that was after he spent a year and a half. At he had Corinth. already spent a year and a half establishing, Personal. I mean, he's the one who established the church. Yeah, raised them up. Yeah, Four exactly. Times. So and, these are different, these are comparisons of different letters yeah. that went, one was polite, the other one was more harsh, and the yeah. harsh one seemed to do it. Yeah. Well, what does that teach us? Well, write harsh letters, I guess. <laughs> no, I think it, I think it tells <laughs> us, I, I hope it tells People us really to, <laughs> to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and you, you may have to write something a little bit stronger sometimes. Anyway, let's look at 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go through it fairly briefly. The first thing Paul says is, you know, please don't Divide yourself up into groups saying, I follow Paul, I'm following Peter, I'm following Apollos, da 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 da, like this, or I'm following Jesus Christ. He said, Look, we're all together. There's no reason to divide up like that. So that's his message, really, in 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, and he says, And we're all, you know, the reason we have what we have is because of the life and death of Jesus. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he says, It's way beyond human wisdom. Uh, you know, the Greeks, they want, they want philosophy. The Jews, they want, uh, you know, signs and wonders, that kind of stuff. But he says all that, I mean, we could give you all that, but that's not what God wants. He wants you to think through the truth. He wants you to become like him. And it goes on through chapter 3, 
Uh, he says, what really happened in your case is that I planted the seed, Apollo's watered, uh, messages you may have received from others helped the thing to grow, but we're all working together. It's not, it's not like one of us is going to be rewarded for doing something and somebody else is going to be rewarded for doing something else. We're all together in this. Um, and then starting with chapter 5, he says, let me deal with some of the issues that, uh, that you asked about. Now it is actually being said that there is sexual immorality among you. This would be among Christians so terrible that not even the heathen would be guilty of it. I am told that a man is sleeping with his stepmother. And you can see that obviously that wasn't a good thing. And bragging about it. Yes, and in bragging. In the church. Yes, yes, yes. And the, if I might, I know you're going through a brief synopsis here of the thing, yeah. but in there in chapter 5, verse 5, hand this man over to Satan mm -hmm. so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and here's the interesting part, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So he's, Paul's not willing to give him up. Christ, he realizes Christ's not willing to give him up, mm -hmm. but hand him over to Satan now, let him be shamed or whatever he needs to do to come back mm -hmm. so that eventually he can be saved. Then we, and very true, in chapter 6, what do we find? Christians are actually going to court against each other before, I, I, among the, uh, and taking their cases to public courts. With non-believing judges. With non-believing judges. He says, surely you know that someday you are going to be part of a, a, a jury that's going to judge angels. And you're saying you can't deal with some of these simple things? We shouldn't be, be laundering our, our dirty laundry in public like this? If, if there's a problem between church members, can't you solve it among yourselves? And he says, you know, getting down to the last part of chapter 6, use your bodies for God's glory. Someone will say, I'm allowed to do anything. Yes, but not everything is good for you. I could say that I'm allowed to do anything, but I'm not going to let anything make me its slave. And then he goes on, the body is not to be used for sexual immorality, but to serve the Lord and the Lord provides for the body, etc. And then, down at the end, avoid immorality. Any other sin a man commits does not affect his body, but the man who is guilty of sexual immorality sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price. So use your bodies for God's glory. Then he comes to another matter that has been a, a matter of great discussion, and that's what about marriage? Remember, he's already talked about the, the man who was living with his stepmother. Now to deal with the matter you wrote about, a man does well not to marry. So the first question is, does this mean all of us who are married are second-class saints? <laughs> I see people chuckling. You, you may love your spouse more than you do God. Well, that would be that would be. And and the surprising, issue surprising, I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. And the issue also was that, in light of that, not necessarily loving more than God, but your spouse is going to take up a lot of time, which yeah, is right. which That's is more likely. Does your spouse take up more time? Which, than Which, if does? you're married, you do need to spend, mm -hmm. rightly so, mm -hmm. but you're spending that time now. Yes. But isn't that con con contradict what God says, go and multiply? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It does. But now, so why does Paul say what he does here? Christ mentioned something himself about that. It's better not to marry. But look at here. Paul says, but because there is so much immorality, every man should have his own wife and every woman should have her own husband. So he almost immediately seems to contradict himself. A man should fulfill his duties as a husband and so forth and so forth. Paul, but Paul is saying, under the circumstances in Corinth. And Paul, Paul believed how long it was going to be until the second coming, if you had asked Paul. Soon. He thought it was going to be very soon. He said, we shouldn't get ourselves mixed up into all kinds of stuff, not even something as good as marriage. Jesus is coming soon. Let's get ready. That, that was his message, basically. But if it's just immorality, why does it say if you have self-control, don't get married? But if you 
but go ahead and get married. Uh, it's better to get married than to burn. Mm -hmm. Yes. Burn with passion. Yes. I know. <laughs> which would, <which, which, laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it seems to me, though, he's really dealing with responsibilities in yeah. these areas. And then later on, it's, it's kind of more serious. He's talking about unbelievers, w uh, wives or husbands, and responsibilities there. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can save them. Well, look at some of those. I tell you this not as an order, but simply as a permission. That's what Paul says. You, you, it's all right to get married. Actually, I would prefer that all you were as I am, but each one has a special gift from God. One person has gift, another one. If you, if you believe that you're, you have a calling to spread the gospel around the Mediterranean world and Paul's day, it's a real hindrance to be married. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Okay. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it would be better for the, you to continue to live alone as I do. Okay? For married people, that would be verse 8. For married people, I have a command which is not my own, but the Lord's. A wife must not leave her husband. Does that mean that what he said before was just Paul's personal opinion? Sounds, Nobody, good. No, Sounds no, good to me. Not, not I, sure? Should we take that part of, out of the Bible? Which part was that? His personal opinion? No, I don't think it's his personal opinion because even Jesus said Moses, you know, like people were supposed to be married forever, but because people are sinful, so they did not be allowed to get divorced and what mm -hmm. have you. But I don't think it's his. Now, now didn't Peter kind of haul his wife around everywhere? Yes. Yeah, like so he's, he's, he was good for that. Yeah. Paul, Good with that. Know, do we? He must have been married in the beginning of his career. Yes. So what did happened? Did she die? Did they divorce? Who knows? Or did she refuse to have anything to do with him after he became a Christian? That's right. It would depend on the spouse. And when she said, do not divorce her, even if she's a non-believer, mm -hmm. if she's willing to stay and, and live with you. Mm -hmm. right, right here in verse 12, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, it goes on, now concerning verse 25, now concerning what you wrote about unmarried people, I do not have a command from the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is worthy of trust. Now surely we can cut this piece out of our Bibles, right? You know, and how did he divide all this, this um, counsel up? Uh -huh. As something being from the Lord and something being from him? And I, I, I mean, what's in you? I mean, it's just hard to imagine he in your on. mind how this happens. He goes on to say, considering the present distress. So this reminds us that every piece of writing, if it's an appropriate writing from a person to somebody else, the way to understand it is to know about the context. Sometimes you might, sometime you might have the experience of uh, finding an old letter you wrote to your parents or something else like that years ago, and you pick it up and you read it. What in the world was I talking about? You know? It's it, because you don't know the context immediately. So Paul says, considering the context, this is what I recommend. And his opinion was, in, was an inspired opinion. Um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, um, but I want to come down To verse uh, 39 and 40. A married woman is not free as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, then she's free to be married to any man she wishes, but only if he's a Christian. She will be happier, however, if she stays as she is. This is my opinion, and I think that I too have God's spirit. Isn't he just clearly saying... Sorry, but he's assuming he's not a woman. How would he know that? That she'll be happier, not, not married. Well, I guess the question is, do you think it's inspired? If it's inspired, that means it's not Paul's message, it's God's message. And it's not just unmarried, mm -hmm. it's unmarried devoted to Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's the mission. There's a mission there. It's not like unmarried and, mm -hmm. you know. But like the Catholic, the nun who are married to Jesus. Well, they depend a bit on our age. And could be the dis their own decision and not being forced into it. Maybe he was inspired to express his opinion. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. maybe you should just pray about it and do whatever comes 
<laughs> after that. No, I don't think that's it. I think Paul's vi if you understand the situation in Corinth, every bit of Paul's vi advice is very good advice. Specific, now, that doesn't specific mean specific to Corinth. So, well, so yes. the the culture was really strange back then, and we can't really put it together. No, no, and know why know why he's saying these things what, what because it was a immoral place, right? We don't live in an immoral place today. Well, I don't know how to compare. I'm it's I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it could get pretty bad compared to even now. Yeah. Uh, how do you know? Yeah. Would, oh, this, would this be specific to Thessalon Thessalonica as well? Would it be Probably. specific to yes. to? But he, when he wrote the Thessalonians, that was kind of a pretty positive letter. A lot of praise and had a lot of good things to say about their faith and so on. So, so what does it have to do with me? Yes, that's the question. Well, and, and we would like to say, okay, all of this, what does it say to us about God? Well, he's not talking about you. You're married. Oh, is it okay. this, is it he's this? talking, about, other than to say, you know, don't walk off and leave your spouse. He's talking to people who aren't married or widowed or... Like I, I personally, I was one of the ones who needed to be married, and I recently became married, and I'm blessed. My wife, she loves the Lord, and we pray all the time. We read the scripture together, so it's been a, a benefit for me, mm -hmm. marriage has. So. And is this one of the parts of the Bible where we have friends in another church where they don't believe in marriage and they devote it to the church and we see what trouble there is. We've also seen trouble amongst ministers that mm -hmm. have been married. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some give and take here is what he's talking about. Yeah. I was married to a Catholic and I was not Catholic. First, when we went to a Catholic church, I realized quickly that Catholicism is really hard on the knees. <laughs> and I did, <laughs> and I did not. I could not accept. You know, we would argue more on Saturday and Sunday more than any other days. So I believe in something. I think you should stay within. You know, someone that believes the things you believe. Yes. Yeah. Well, Paul said that, didn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next section in Corinth, in First Corinthians, is a, a three-chapter section, eight, nine, and ten. And I have to give you a little background before we look at this section. You remember we talked uh, last time a little bit about the, <coughs> about the historical background. Paul had been called with some friends from Antioch down to Jerusalem in AD 49 to discuss the issues about the fact that so many, Paul was especially, was responsible for, for, for winning so many Gentiles to become Christians. And the Jews were very concerned that pretty soon the Christian church was not going to be a Jewish church anymore. And so they had this conference, and the conference is all spelled out in, in, in Acts chapter 15. And I'm going to look at um, just a part of it. Look at Acts chapter 15. Then the apostles and the elders, I'm reading from verse 22, Acts 15:22 together with the whole church, decided to choose some men from, among the, from the group and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Now they're going to give us the conclusions of their conference. They chose two men who were highly respected by the believers, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas. And they sent the, the following letter to them, We the apostles and elders, your brothers send greetings to all our brothers in Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, and so forth. And you read down through, and it's, look at verse 27. We, we send you then Judas and Silas who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no, uh, uh, eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. Okay? So there are the four instructions. And that Why was are those more important than anything else? Well, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. What was, what was the concern when this conference was called? Those Gentiles Jews. coming into the church. Yeah. Gentiles coming into the church. And why would that be a problem? Shouldn't they be welcomed with open arms? Yeah, they do things that, that Jews didn't, didn't agree with. They're not 
cultural things. They're not acculturated. They're I they see. bring some of their their, their bad habits and they eat weird, bad language weird and things and other bad habits and <laughs> and okay. They don't fit in, and they, I see. They, they, they're going to corrupt us. So really what we're talking about here was a conference about how to get along in the church. We're not talking about the gospel here. This is not anything about the gospel. This is, okay, if you Gentiles are going to join us and worship with us Jews, we expect you to do these things. That's what this conference is about. And who was there? Oh, who led out, by the way? James. Okay, Peter made a speech. Paul made a speech. I'm sure it's Paul's speech we don't have. Paul and Barnabas were there, and they went back with some other people confirming this message. Paul left from there, went to Corinth. Well, actually, yeah, went to Corinth, spent a year and a half in Corinth, went back to Antioch, and now he's on his third missionary journey, and he knows that these people in Corinth have some problems with this business about food offered to idols. So we come to 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning what you wrote about food offered to idols, it is true, of course, that all of us have knowledge, as they say. Such knowledge, however, puffs a person up with pride. Does that sound like a good thing? No, it doesn't. But love builds up. Those who think they know something really don't know as they ought to know, but the person who loves God is known by him. So then, about eating the food offered to idols, we know that an idol stands for something that does not really exist. We know there's only the one God. And Paul goes on to explain bit by bit why he believes that these idols uh, don't affect the food in any way. Now to understand the situation in Corinth, there was a central market in this large city. But in every road that came in from different directions to the city, there were a lot of these temples. And at these temples were idols. And it was expected, if you were a farmer bringing produce into the city, you would stop at one of these temples, you would offer a portion of what you had to sell at that temple, and but th so that would mean then that the rest of the food that you were selling at the central market would be dedicated to that idol. And it would be believed that if you ate that food and you were blessed, you would be blessed because of what? The blessing of that idol. Now, it so happens that the idols preferred meat, and I mean by that flesh meat, and wine. And so usually the portion that got given to the, to the temple was a, a bit of meat and a bit of wine. And then the rest of it was going to... So, what do we have going on here? We have a certain kind of food being dedicated to the idols, but what about, what, what about fruits and vegetables? Idols didn't like them. Well, the idols didn't pay much attention to fruits and vegetables. They weren't too excited about these fruits and vegetables. So they were not offered to the idols. So now, you have a choice. What happens if you want to follow the instructions given from the general conference at Jerusalem? Eat fruits and vegetables. Are you required to be a vegetarian? Well, we'll talk about that when we come back. Don't go away. It's a very interesting story.
Now to get the full picture of what Paul was trying to say here, we're going to dip over into Romans just a moment and see what he says over there. Look at Romans 14, the first few verses. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. The person who will eat anything is not to despise the one who doesn't, while the one who eats only vegetables is not to pass judgment on the one who will eat anything, for God has accepted that person. Who are you to judge the servants of someone else? So who, we as Christians are all supposed to be servants of whom? Of God. So we don't have the right to, being, to judge our fellow Christians because they are children of God. They're supposed to be servants of God. He's the one that they're responsible to. Some people think, verse 5, that a certain day is more important than other days, while others think that all days are the same. We each should firmly make up our own minds. Well, that ought to throw a kink on almost anybody's thinking, especially if they have any concern for the seven-day Sabbath, right? So we come back to 1 Corinthians 8, and now drop over to chapter 10, since we're doing a very sort of cursory, sort of area view of this whole thing, and look at uh, verse 23 now, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. We are allowed to do anything, so they say. That is true, but not everything is good. We are allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful. None of you should be looking out for your own interests, but for the interests of others. So what's Paul saying there? What, what does he mean by allowed? Who is allowing this? They're, they're saying, Paul is saying, this is what should be allowed by Christians, by other, among other Christians in the church. Or be allowed to do anything. Sorry. Other Christians are allow other Christians to do anything. Paul, what Paul is really saying is, Christians are completely free, but, but let's not cause others to stumble. Let's not confuse let's, them with... And we read on, verse 25, you are free to eat anything sold in the meat market without adding, in, asking any questions because of your conscience. Now, first of all, notice this has nothing to do with diet or cholesterol or any that kind of stuff. We're talking here about food that has been offered to idols. Okay? For as it's, if it's been offered to an idol, it's okay if I eat it. Okay, well, let's think about that for a moment. Does, do you believe the idol has any real existence? No. No. I'm asking you, Jay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Those monkeys, I'm... I kind of wonder about those. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but Daniel did. Well, we're going to come to Daniel in a moment. Okay. So the point is, do those idols have any existence? The truth is, no. There are chunks of metal, there are chunks of stone, there are chunks of wood. They have no power to affect the food in any way. So Paul says, whether you eat or whether you don't eat is, is another question. But if you're asking about your conscience, it should have no effect here. But he doesn't stop there. For as the scripture says, the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go, eat what is set before you without asking any question because of your conscience. Remember, what again, he's not asking any question about cholesterol. He's not asking any question about whether it's healthy. It's a question about your conscience. But if someone tells you, this food was offered to idols, then do not eat that food. For the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake, that is not your own conscience, but the other person's conscience. Well then, someone asks, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I thank God for my food, why should anyone criticize me about food for which I give thanks? Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. And Paul is basically saying, if you do something that makes somebody else stumble, that's not for God's glory. And then he concludes with the first verse of chapter 11, which really belongs with chapter 10. Imitate me then, just as I imitate Christ. So what's, go ahead. Does that mean, let's say I go to State of Brothers and I'm reaching for the chicken. And I see a seven-day Adventist staring at me. 
No That's longer, right. You just no longer free. Whoops. <laughs> I, I'm actually what is this? You what? Laugh and what? Get the you eat chicken? No, I'm just no, no, no. But uh, it has happened to me. One woman actually <laughs> reached in my thing and look at it and read it and hmm, and put it back. <laughs> okay. And now, oh, what? Well, let's think about that. The question, <laughs> the question here is not about what's good for people to eat. That's a separate issue. We should resolve on another occasion. The question here is, was that chicken offered to an idol? No. No. So that's not what Paul is talking about here. But what Paul is saying is, we as Christians should not do anything which would be a stumbling block for other Christians. Now your chicken is back in the question. <laughs> yes. Sir. Are you a stumbling block to another Christian? Yeah, to the lady who was reading my thing. Sure. She probably yeah. would have been happier had I put it back and gotten a veggie meat. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how that would be a stumbling block. Because to me, you can look at it the other way, that that person's oppressing you and not letting you have your freedom. That they're over there telling you, you're not supposed to do this, don't do that, okay. and just follow what I say, or that's the way it goes. Okay. And I maintain the chicken is the idol. <laughs> okay, but Gary has a very important point that a lot of people miss when they read this passage because who is it that we're supposed to be concerned about? Our fellow Christians. Well, not just fellow Christians. What kind of fellow Christians? Back in Romans 14, what did it say? Fellow Christians that are weaker. And who are the weaker ones? The vegetarians. <laughs> well, <laughs> now, now, why are they weak? You said that they're vegeta they eat vegetables because they know that the vegetables don't get offered to idols. Okay, is that there, what it there is? Were, there were two groups of people that could be offended by your eating meat offered to idols. One group would be those who really had recently come in out of paganism, and they weren't still completely sure about what those idols were real. Mm -hmm. And you might cause one of those people to stumble if they see you eating that food. And it turns out, actually, the rest of the story is that it turns out that these temples didn't want just lots of meat and wine. They wanted money. So they started restaurants where they would turn around and sell portions of this meat and wine that they had gotten from their offerings. And they would sell them and they would prepare them in their restaurants. and. You know, should a Christian go to one of those restaurants, he talks specifically about eating food in an idol temple. Now, it doesn't mean that you're there worshiping the idol. It means you're there at the restaurant. Are you allowed to eat the food that's available in the restaurant at an idol temple or meat that came from the idol temple? Yes, as long as nobody's watching you, right? Well, that's the question. <laughs> now, here's the... Here's that's the, just here's like the, the movie theaters back here, in the old days. Here's the trick. Here's the trick. Let's be very honest. If, you're, if you think you're making a new Christian stumble, then you better back off. But if that person has been in the way longer than you are and is trying to dictate to you and they're, they've been Christian longer than you have, then they are responsible for what their thoughts are and you don't have to be responsible for them. So you can eat that chicken. And I, and I imagine that the lady that was concerned about the chicken, mm -hmm. she, was, she was just uh, completely concerned about your health and worried about the hormones and things <laughs> injected in the chicken. Possibly. <laughs> it, it seems okay. to me that the Gentiles had a very similar thing going to what the Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem did. Mm -hmm. They were all making money. And probably none of it was that good for the standards of the day. Mm -hmm. Certainly no refrigeration. You wonder no. what they bought. Yeah. There was one brother that went through the, the um, <coughs> Stater Brothers type thing, and they had some, a real good cut of meat. And they, they, they looked at everybody and said, oh, this is for my dog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, nobody believed them. But then I found out they did buy it for the dog. Well, some, so. it's amazing. Some, <laughs> some meats are actually cheaper than dog food <laughs> per, on a per pound basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so now we, we, we've seen that um, there's one other thing. Well, let me just put it this way. We need to move. Well, let, let's talk about the Daniel thing. I guess that's, we probably ought to know. No. This is a very inter interesting situation because people look at the experience of Daniel in chapter one and we say, Daniel stood up for the right. He ate only the vegetables instead of the king's rich food. 
Well, if you go back and you look at that passage carefully, and especially if, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you read what Ellen White says about it, and it turns out the real reason why Daniel didn't eat the king's meat is because it had been offered to idols. And he didn't want the king to think that if he did well in, his, in school or did well on the final examinations, it was because of the blessings of his idols. So the reason Daniel ate what he did primarily was because it had been offered to idols. He refused to eat the food that had been offered to idols. Now, it just so happened that the food had not been offered to idols was healthier for you also. That's still the truth. Mm -hmm. It's still true, okay? But now, so Daniel in his day said, I'm going to eat only the stuff that's not offered to idols. I am rejecting idols. Paul in his day said, now let me think about this for a moment. If I refuse to eat this food, I am suggesting perhaps that these idols are real. So if I refuse to eat the food, I am respecting idols. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretending like, like the idols are real. So I am going to eat the food that has been offered to idols because I know those idols don't affect that food one tiny little bit. So Daniel refused to eat the food because that was a way of rejecting idols. Paul said, I eat the food, and that's my way of rejecting idols. What do we call that? Situation ethics. Oh, dear. Oh, please. Oh, help. Situation ethics. That used to be a bad word. We call that rationalization. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 we call that here are two Christian gentlemen who have looked at the circumstances in which they lived and they said, I am absolutely determined to stand up for the truth of God as far as possible and based on that, I'm going to do this here. Daniel did what he did and it worked out very well for Daniel. Paul did what he did and it worked out very well for Paul. Now one thing we haven't mentioned, which we need to mention, what about the command given from the general conference that said you're not supposed to eat food offered to idols? What about that? I, I like he rejected how that the too. Message Bible says, ha handles this toward them. Even though you may be indifferent as to where it came from, he isn't. And you don't want to send mixed messages to him about who you are worshiping. This yes. is when you've been invited out. Yeah. It's the crux of it right there. Yeah, exactly. But Paul says when he's with the Gentiles, he acts like a Gentile. When he, but Paul changes, you know, mm -hmm. depending on the but, situation. Okay, but why is, he t <laughs> why, is he, why is he doing that? To win. So that by all means I might win some. You don't win people by offending them. No. That's right. See, no. That's the point. That's what Paul is trying to say here. And Paul is saying here, look, I respect the General Conference brethren, but they don't understand the situation in Rome, and they don't understand the situation in Corinth, and right here, in order to show our rejection of idols, this is the right thing to do, this is God's guidance, this is what I write under inspiration. Now that's, that's, a, that's a very high standard. You know. But this had nothing to do with health. It has nothing to do with the health laws or no. of, of Leviticus or anything else. This That's is, why he kept, keeps talking about your conscience. This, this is, this is, you've got these idle things mixed in here, and that's what he's having to deal with. Yes. <coughs> so we move on now. Um, they briefly talks about women covering their head in worship. He talks about the Lord's Supper. Um, I think those, hopefully those passages are fair, fair, fairly straightforward. Then we come to a, cha a section, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, which are another group that talk about the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And what does he say? And, and, and among those, of course, is this, the, the focus is on the speaking of tongues. And Paul just says there are different gifts given. Uh, the Spirit gives one person a message. This is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom, while to another person the same message gives a 
the same spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One in the same spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person he gives the power to heal. The spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the spirit and those that do not, and so forth. To one person he gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another he gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is, it is one in the same spirit who does all this as he wishes. He gives a different gift to each person. So then he talks about the fact that all these gifts are supposed to work together for what? The building up of the church and the glorification of God, right? That's what all these, I mean, God doesn't give you one gift and me a different gift and each one of us a different gift so that we can go our different ways. He, he gives us these different gifts so that we can bring those gifts together and each do our part to build up the body of Christ, right? So he said, and the most important of all is 1 Corinthians 13, which we've already read, love. He says, if you want to be a part of the body of Christ's church, then the dominant relationship, the dominant factor, must be love. Not speaking in tongues? Not speaking in tongues. So then in chapter 14, what does it say about speaking in tongues? Can we boil it down? We know he spoke several languages, Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, who maybe some other dialects. So. But he, he, he says, you know, he says, you know, if you're going to speak in these tongues, let one person speak at a time, let another person carefully interpret what he has to say. Now, is this the same as what was going on back in Acts 2? No. How do you know? Well, so that everybody understood Back in Acts 2, had everybody understood in their own language. They understood their own language. They didn't need any interpreters. So this is clearly not what was going on back in Acts 2. So finally, Paul says, what does he say? If then the whole church, starting from verse 23, if then the whole church meets together and everyone starts speaking strange tongues, and if some ordinary people or unbelievers come in, won't they say that you're all crazy? I mean, it's just like a babbling whatever is going on. Mm -hmm. But if everyone is proclaiming God's message when some unbelievers or ordinary people come in, they will be convinced of their sin by what they hear. They will be judged by all they hear. Their secret thoughts will be brought into the open, and they will, be bow, and they will bow down and worship God, confessing, truly God is here among you. And then finally, Paul says um, in... It's verse, um, well, let me read, starting from verse 29. Two or three who are given God's message should speak, while the others are to judge what they say. But if someone sitting in the meeting receives a message from God, the one who is speaking should stop. All of you may proclaim God's message one by one, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. As in all the church, well, verse 34, the women should keep quiet in the meetings. They are not allowed to speak as Jewish law says. They must not be in charge. If they want to find out about something, they should ask their husbands at home. It's a disgraceful thing for a woman to speak in, in a church meeting. He <laughs> said that's inspired too. God told him that. Yes, of course. At that time. Well, why would he do that? I would guess there was a problem with the women who were speaking out in churches there. There And, and the church at Corinth, what was going on? Above, and the, uh, there's a high plateau above Corinth. There was a church dedicated to the goddess of love up there. There were a thousand temple virgins, notice the quotation marks, that lived up there. And every night about four o'clock, every evening about four o'clock, they would send it, descend into the, to the city to do you know what. That was their job. And Paul said, we must do everything possible to separate our church, to make it as obvious to anybody, anybody who walks in the door, we want them to know we are not like these other groups and how they worship. So that was a situation that applied to Corinth at that point in time. It doesn't necessarily apply to others. Just, just so the, some folks may not have understood what you were saying, they were, they were earning money for the temple yes. using their bodies. Yes. And then bringing the money back. Yes. In 1 Church Timothy 
church was the pimp. Yes. <laughs> In 1 Timothy said, Now I permit a woman neither to teach nor exercise authority over a man, but let her be in quietness. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. He's not talking about, he's talking about something t totally different here because Adam has a higher hierarchy because, you know, Eve, Eve was taken from him. But they were both created by God. Everything is created by God. Yes. And when, when someone quotes that verse to me, I remind them that, Eve may have been taken out of Adam, but every Adam since that time has been taken out of Eve. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, Paul's conclusion really is back in verse 18 of, verse, of chapter 14. I thank God that I speak in strange tongues much more than any of you. And someone's already mentioned, Paul spoke a number of different languages. But in church worship, I would rather speak five words that can be understood in order to teach others, then speak thousands of words in strange tongues. Now, if we did that, what would happen to that whole experience? It would cease to happen. It would cease to happen. Well, in chapter 15, um, there's a whole chapter about the resurrection, and Paul talks about his own experience um, and how he saw Christ in vision and so forth. And he concludes over with verse 50, 1 Corinthians 50 and following. What I mean, friends, is that what is made of flesh and blood cannot share in God's kingdom, and what is mortal cannot possess immortality. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again. We shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory. Where death is your power to hurt and, and so forth. We're going to jump over now to in our last few uh, minutes. I'm yeah. sorry, Ken, if I could. That was brilliant what you read. Some people may misunder, not misunderstand, but may miss this point. Verse 52 in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, mm -hmm. for the trumpet will sound, and this answers the question later, the dead will be raised. Mm -hmm. For the trumpet will sound, the last trumpet, and the dead will be raised. There's, the no, there's no mistaking. Mm -hmm. It says what it says. Okay. Now, you remember that I said that there was uh, four letters from Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the first couple of verses. It sounds like Paul is starting a new letter. I, Paul, make a personal appeal to you. I, who am said to be meek and mild when I'm with you, but harsh with you when I'm away. By the gentleness and kindness of Christ, I beg you not to force me to be harsh when I come. So this, we believe, is a part of, or maybe all of, these next four chapters of that letter he wrote, the harsh letter. And look at some of the wording. Look at chapter 11. Uh, and let's, um, in, the, in, in the short time we have, look at starting with verse 16. I repeat, no one should think that I'm a fool, but if you do, at least accept me as a fool, just so I will have a little to boast of. Of course, what I'm saying now is not what the Lord would have me say. In this matter, I'm b uh, boasting. I'm really talking like a fool. And then drop down to uh, verse 22. Well, verse 21, I am ashamed to admit that we are too timid to do those things. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I'm talking like a fool. I will be just as daring. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I'm a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more times. I've been whip, whipped much more. I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Five times, notice that. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I've been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. And this is before the shipwreck that we know about, so forth. In my many travels, I've been in danger from floods and from robbers and so forth. Paul says, these people who are coming and they're saying, we're Jews and we're, we, we've been through so much trouble. And, you know, you need to go back to the old Jewish ways. Paul says, those people haven't even come close to what I've been through. Well, Paul comes back, and when he finds out that the, Jew, that the people in Corinth have accepted his message, he says these words found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that uh, 
that I think every one of us should uh, re read very carefully. I'm going to start uh, with verse 16. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us a task of making others his friends also. That's our job. Christ is our friend, and Paul is charging us to make other people God's friends also. Our message is that God was making all human beings his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us a message that tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though Christ himself were making his appeal through us. And that's exactly what God wants to do. He wants to make his appeal through us. Matthew 5, 16, we should be like a light, a light set on a hill. Okay? We plead on Christ's behalf, let, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Paul, through these four books of Corinthians that we have condensed down in two, into two, um, is trying to show how a real Christian gentleman reaches out to people that he loves and speaks them in a, in, in a most appropriate Christian way to talk about all their problems and try to pull them together to be the kind of example that he wants, the, the, the kind of people who would live as, re, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, the kind of people that he talks about here in 2 Corinthians 5 who are examples to Christ, who, who, who win other people. They, who, people just look at them and they say, I want to be like that. And you say, okay, follow my example as I'm following Christ's example. That's Paul's message here in Corinth, all, all four books. And Paul finally ended up down in Corinth, and we're going to find out next time that he wrote the books to the Galatians, and he wrote the, books, the book of Romans there in Corinth in light of all these messages, all this information that we've just studied in the book of Corinthians. So we challenge you to be with us next time. See you then.